Association are set to block several routes into Dublin tomorrow morning as part of a protest against fuel prices. A large group of trucks will leave various locations from 7 o'clock in the morning, travelling on the M1, M2, M3, M4, M7 and M11. The organisers say they want the government to address the nation and the fuel issue. Otherwise, they will return in bigger numbers a week before Christmas. That's it for now. We'll have more in the next hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Plan your winter sun in Lanzarote, Tenerife and Gran Canaria. But hurry, seats are selling fast. Mainly dry tonight with some mist and fog patches in parts of the south. Rain extending eastwards from the northwest later tonight. Cold with lowest temperatures of minus 2 to plus 2 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Run on Off The Ball with Gillette. Proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, start your razors. This is News Talk. Welcome along, everyone. Joe here with you on this Tuesday evening. So thus far, the Michael Carrick era at Manchester United is just a little bit dull. 52 minutes on the clock. They are nil all the way to Villarreal. Dave McIntyre is watching the game. He's going to drop in at full time and give us the full story. Meanwhile, Brian Kerr is a St. Patrick's athletic legend, lifelong fan, 10 years as manager from 86 to 96 during which he won two league titles. We're going to chat to Brian at 8 o'clock ahead of the FAI Cup final on Sunday. Ken Hogan, meanwhile, former tip all-star, he managed two teams to county title victories on Sunday. That's two teams, two finals, all in one day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. So Ken Hogan is going to join us 8.40 or so. Then Dan McDonald along for the football show. Chelsea Juve, one of the better games at 8 o'clock. 53106, the text number. We're at Off The Ball on Twitter. We have Richie McCormick with us as ever. Hello, sir. Joe, oh, how are you? Yeah, very well, my man. And Ronan Mullen, hello to you. Hey, Joe. If this is the Michael Carrick era, I don't want to be a part of it, Ronan. <laughs> oh, well, it's been uh, pragmatic. It's been functional. It's been, you know, not technically superfluous or anything like it. So a bit like Michael Carrick himself. I think he's put his imprint on this team. But yeah, like... It wouldn't have taken much to get rid of the atrophy that had set in under Solskjaer. I think you or I, Joe, could have sat on the sideline there in our little little blazers. He looked quite well, to be fair. He looks the part as manager, but uh, I think any sort of revamp of the side would have brought about some change. And obviously the notable thing is no Bruno Fernandes, but aside from that, it is, it is very much the same Manchester United we've seen in recent weeks. We'll chat more to Dave at full time, but the Manchester United team for the first 22 minutes was one of the most bizarre efforts at a formation I can remember in some time. I mean, on paper, it didn't look horrific. Basically, they had two things going on. In possession, De Gea was in goal, the back four was Juan Bissaka, Lindelof, Maguire and Alex Tellez. That's fine. So in possession, it was sort of like McTominay, Fred, Van der Beek and then Sancho, Martial through the middle and Ronaldo on the left. And then out of possession, they'd switch to a 4-4-2 where Fred would sprint out to the left-hand touchline because Ronaldo sure as hell wasn't going to track back. Van de Beek would drop into midfield alongside McTominay. Sancho went to right wing and Martial Ronaldo played as a two in a 4-4-2. And frankly, it was just horrifically bad. They spent a lot of the first 20 minutes pointing at each other. No, that's your... No, you have to close. You know, you close him down. No, you go. Ronaldo... I'm not even going to ask you, Ronaldo. That kind of a thing for 20 minutes. And then in the end, they went 4-5-1. Martial went out to the left-hand side. And even Michael Carrick, 20 minutes into his reign, Richie said, yeah, I can't really have Ronaldo on the left wing. This is a bad idea. So you just play up top there and do your whole uh, two presses per half business. Yeah, I've I've been dipping in and out of it because I've I've obviously been working on other other stuff. But like, it's been playing out like uh, a a match between a third and fourth place side in the final round of great matches because <clears throat> United like clearly are, are completely devoid of confidence of, of any degree and Villarreal are like a counterpunching team they kind of always operate with results that are better than the sum of their parts that's just saying that the Europa League win last season kind of bears that out but when they have opposition like tonight's whereby there's nothing really you know to it and there's not that much needle to the match it's just lacking in any kind of engagement at all and yeah. like it's going to play out like this for a while and it kind of shows what's imperative for United which is to get the right man like I mentioned last night to get the right man and to get him in quickly and I know there's been talks today about who they would like and their prospective candidates on an interim basis should their preferred candidate of uh, Mauricio Pochettino not work out Uh, but yeah like if 
tonight is any evidence, it's that they need to work pretty fast to get somebody in because anything like this going forward for any spell in the league especially is going to just completely put pay to any chance they have of playing Champions League football again next season. Yeah, true. I presume you're at the Aviva Stadium on Sunday, Richie? Oh, yes, I am. Yeah, I was reading, by the way, ticket sales, very swift. So this is five days ago. They were at past 25,000. So that trumps any attendance at the Aviva since 2010, which is very tidy. And great value, by the way. You know, yep. it's worth stating if you're a football fan and you want to go to a world class stadium and potentially bring your kids or even just go along with your mates, 15 euro for a ticket. And for the family ticket, which is two adults, two children, it's a grand total of 30 euro, which is really reasonable yeah. for St. Pat's Bows. We felt as a counterweight to the nonstop Bows propaganda from you over several months now, in fact, years, we should uh, go heavy on Pat's this evening. So, Brian Kerr, Fair enough. eight o'clock on uh, his lifelong love affair with Pats. Uh, he says he loves them more than ever. He's been to more games this season than ever. He just... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, there. yeah. yeah. One, one of the constants you see of the like sports file uh, filings or infos filings, like the, the photography agencies from uh, home games for St. Pats, is there'll always be a picture of Brian standing on the Kamak, uh, just watching on the match, just there you know, in a spectator's capacity. Like, that man's dedication to his club mm. should not be sniffed at whatsoever. And, yeah, just a quick update to the ticket sales thing. Um, 30,000, as of today, nice. sold for the match. So there's going to be a hell of an atmosphere on Sunday. It's going to be brilliant. A bit of trivia about Richmond Park. So I spoke to Brian earlier, because obviously he wanted to watch the football. So this blew my mind. Uh, mm. He was there from 86 to 96, won the league title in 1990 and 96. And they spelt uh, two or three years, or certainly two years away from Richmond Park, they were at Harold's Cross because they were getting the stadium done up. And also the pitch levelled. So it turns out, as David De Gea, by the way, makes an absolute wonder save, still nil all, uh, 59 minutes on the clock between Villarreal and Manchester United. It turns out that until they did the work on the pitch, around 92 or so, there was a six foot three drop a six foot three hill from one goal line to the other goal line at Richmond Park. Running up and yeah. down that hill in the second half was uh, no. Imagine <laughs> that's a hell, that is a hill. Six foot three. You'd, you'd so, be puffing after that, wouldn't you? I think I'm, yeah. Would you get six foot three on incline in the gym? I don't think so. That's 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 uh, just short of me <laughs> in, to put it into the actual layman's terms. Imagine? That's that's literally two inches short oh. of me in a difference. Imagine that's the ridiculous. Second, second half. You're three nil down. You're playing up the hill, and you're midfielder, and you chase back up that hill. You would just say no. I'm sick of this. So uh, they fixed that. Pun, the, the 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 <laughs> uh, I do bring you exciting news, though, to uh, yeah, balance the St. Pat's loving this evening, tomorrow evening. Yep. Yeah. And by the way, nobody steal this idea. We we we've been on to him. We booked him. Hands bloody off on the football show yeah. tomorrow. Bohemian superfan yeah. Johnny Logan. Yes. Come on. <laughs> now we're talking. What a hero. Now what we're talking. an absolute hero. Performed at the last FA Cup final, which Bows were present uh, back in 2008 in the RDS. Him and uh, Paul McLoon, ex Macaroni House there, um, did their respective songs to G up Bows and Derry on that particular day. So yeah, uh, Johnny has provided his own uh, bit of support today as well. And glad we are to have it too. What a legend. Well, look, any night you can say Johnny Logan on the football sheet show this evening, Ronan. Um, I have to say, Bowes must have Bowes have a pretty good uh, celebrity per capita in terms of their following and like going through a few notable Bowes fans today. PJ Galler, obviously, Eric Lawler does his bits. You've got Roddy Doyle, but J Lo, the original J Lo, it's um, it's the only show in ten as far as I'm concerned. Tomorrow, Three time Eurovision winner, they don't fall out of the sky. You they know what I mean? No, they really don't. I consider oh, consider this, by the way, off the ball, cocking our leg and peeing on Johnny Logan. Nobody steal him tomorrow. There's an image for you. Wow. So uh, See, there we it's go. It's usually down to me to lower the tone, Joe, isn't it? <laughs> well, so, the uh, influence has become terrible. Well, it has. It has, it has. So uh, Johnny Logan Only, tomorrow yeah. and Brian Kerr this evening. If, if there's a better way to preview the cup final, I don't know, Ron. Just on the, on the slope at Richmond Park thing, I remember playing underage football around Dundalk and there was one particular pitch. I won't name them, won't shame the club, but they had a slope behind the goal. And if you kicked the ball wide and it went in there, you had to go and get it. So if anything, away teams were more, or I should say less inclined to, to pot shot from range because it's only, not only you get a ball enough, your manager, you'd also be told to go and retrieve the ball. So I know, I'm, I know it all too well. Yeah. Some uh, texts in, lads, is Pochettino really going to dump Messi, Mbappe, Neymar for Maguire, Fred Lingard? 
I mean, I take the question. Apparently, he's really open to this. That's the reporting across the board and it does seem as if he wants to get back to the Premier League. It does seem as if his relationship with Leonardo is very difficult day to day to day to day. So that would grind... Everybody's relationship with Leonardo has been has been difficult so far, True. judging by... And like he hasn't done great work in the contract front either. So you would suggest that, you know, Nasser al Khalifi, who's looking after PSG, obviously would we'll be looking at the role that Leonardo's played in the last couple of years because it hasn't necessarily um, been a great one. I don't think they were too happy to have let Tuchel go and then watch him go and do what Chelsea did last season uh, under his tutelage. Um, yeah, it hasn't gone down well. So that for them to lose Pochettino because of a relationship with Leonardo, I don't think would augur well for the Brazilians' prospects in Paris. Yeah. What is the, what is the crack with Leonardo? Like I remember him doing, he used to rock in for international tournaments on the BBC and he just seemed like a carefully affable guy and then all of a sudden he seems like a demon behind the scenes at a person. Well, so. tell, that, tell that to Tab Ramos back in 94 when he shattered his jaw. U- uh, USA 94 Pasadena. is all you need to know. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, like he, he's turned into a pretty astute um, businessman and he got, you know, uh, obviously PSG was one of his former clubs and he got his feet under the table there in terms of the board. So, yeah, it's just he's made that transition and he's kind of made it his own but he hasn't necessarily made a success in it. And nowhere to hide for the players now that ollie has gone. We're about to find out if the issue was with him or with them, says Paul. Well, as Villarreal plays another close effort and goal just over the bar after 62 minutes, I think, Paul, we're getting the answer, really. And then Barb 83, skulls hit the nail on the head at halftime in BT Sport. Or actually, it was in advance, in advance of the game in BT Sport. He said, mm-hmm. Carrick and Fletcher should be embarrassed to be still at the club after their failure under Ole. Yeah, I saw that. It was doing the rounds on Twitter. To be fair to him, he wasn't saying Carrick and Fletcher are a disgrace. He was more saying it's embarrassing for them. You know, like it's put them in a really tough position and he almost felt sorry for them. And there's a degree of like, how can they walk into the players yesterday and today and try and pretend that it's some kind of new regime? It's not. They should have all been put out of their misery was Skulls' point. Anyway, let's move on with the news round, which is with thanks to Gillette, proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, start your razors. And Richie, there is uh, the live football this evening. I think that's where you're starting. Yeah, Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford uh, about to come on for Manchester United into the second half at the Estadio de la Ceramica in the evening's Group F encounter. Scoreless, as you mentioned, the other game in Group F has an 8pm start and sees young boys entertain Atalanta. Chelsea, they need a win tonight to keep any hope of qualifying as Group H winners alive. They're away to the group leaders, Juventus, who themselves need only a point to secure a top spot. Elsewhere in that group, Zenit have made the trip to play Malmo. There was a 5.45 start in the Group E game in Ukraine, where it is currently Dinamo Kiev nil. Bayern Munich 2. Uh, Robert Lewandowski opened the scoring for Bayern this evening. The second for them came three minutes before the break from Kingsley Coleman. Interesting news line out of uh, Bayern today. Joshua Kimmich, Serge Gnabry, Jamal Mosialia, Eric Maxim Chubamoting and Michael Cuisance are all self-isolating in line with club policy. They're not being paid for every day they miss as they opted against being vaccinated. But it's reported that Kimmich, Canabry and Cuisance are to perform a U-turn on their vaccine obstinance. And finally, in Group G tonight, the group leader Salzburg are away to Wolfsburg and bottom side Sevilla host Lille. I'm a Galway expat living in Rathmines, says Killian in Dublin. And there's a posh school on the main street who have a pitch out the front and the pitch must drop at least 10 feet from front to back. It is weird looking. And Paul points out there is a four foot slope on the pitch at St James's Park Newcastle yeah so where that Newcastle have a big slope all right on uh, Fernandez being dropped here Ronan what do we want to read into that was uh, did Daniel did, did, did you have the instinctive sense as uh, Solskjaer was waving to the crowd and Bruno was taking it upon himself to you know tell the crowd how to behave there is a degree with Bruno of just wind your neck in at the moment you know see like you're playing abysmally and you turn your hands around at everyone and now you're going off at the fans for their behavior I just wonder if, like, he's starting to graze with Manchester United supporters, I would think. Yeah, possibly. Like, I know when things are going swimmingly, he's the totem of it. And the team was obviously built around him basically since day one of his arrival at Old Trafford. And obviously not the case. It's been well worn at this stage that they have to cater to Ronaldo and he has to take, at best, second, second fiddle in that regard. But to his credit, and he's not getting a lot of it in recent weeks, obviously, but, like, when he's on the ball, he's trying things and he does, like, he does actually work off the ball contrary to what people say. Like he does actually put a shift in too. I get your point about the gesticulation and maybe be, there is an there's an element of when he does press and no one follows in behind him that he turns around and maybe throws his arms up in the air. That doesn't go down well with teammates and it doesn't go down well with fans either. And yet when he's not producing those assists and goals, it's hard to justify his place in the team because it's a bit like 
if you try those things and they come off, you're, you're hailed as a genius. If you don't do it, you're seen as giving the ball away and those stats will add up, especially in a team with such a bad defensive record as Manchester United at the moment. So Danny van de Beek made more sense in this game that he'll he'll keep things taken over, won't be overly showy. And that's kind of been the, the kernel of tonight's performance, actually. Lads, can't wait to hear Brian Kerr. Pat's legend won the league for the first time since the 50s. Never to be forgotten, says Tony, who's a big Pat's fan. Uh, there was a quote I was uh, looking at which caught the eye in advance of talking to Brian from Dave Henderson, a well-known goalkeeping figure for many oh, yeah. years and uh, character. And he you know, had a big career even before St. Pat's when Brian picked him up. And he was there for that first title win, the one in 1990 when they were playing at Harold's Cross. And he had a great quote. I think it was in the 42. It might have been... Uh, I'm not sure who did the piece out of my head. Come back to me. Anyway, he was saying of the time at St. Pat's when they won the league, it was the maddest dressing room I was ever in. Not mad mad, funny mad. We didn't do things that were the norm. Like in the dressing room at Harold's Cross, there was an adjoining room to the opposition's dressing room and cared of Nudger, his assistant Paul Nugent, cared of Nudger eavesdropping on their team talks. Suddenly you'd get this shush you were told to keep quiet while Nudger listened to what their manager had to say. <laughs> Be more of that in football. Like that that kind of stuff. Like the, the whole Spygate thing with Bielsa and Lampard a couple of years ago. Like I absolutely live for that kind of thing. Uh, whereby amazing. there's a bit of underhandedness but not necessarily evil, you know? That kind of <laughs> li, li, little bit of edge. The right amount of bending of that rule. Exactly, I, exactly. Is it even a written rule that you can't eavesdrop on the opposition team talk? I wouldn't even think it is. Of course it's not. Of course it's not. So, that's the live football this evening. Where are we going next? Uh, down to the RSC because Waterford owner Richard Forrest has defended his decision to sack manager Mark Burcham. He was relieved of his duties three days before the Blues play UCD in the promotion relegation playoff, funnily enough, at Richmond Park. Burcham claims he found out about his sacking on Twitter, having initially tweeted to say he was suspended for a disagreement with Forrest. In turn, Forrest this evening says he was given no option but to sack Burcham, having been, as he put it, backed into a corner. Not too sure what's going on here. Dan McDonnell has been on the case. He will be with us between 9 and 10, so we will get details on that. Marcus Rashford was in on goal, just failed to control the ball, although it turns out he would have been offside either way. Still nil all in Villarreal. Now, Colin Boyle. Yeah, he today became the latest Mayo stalwart to call time on their inter-county career. The Davids club man has spent nearly 14 years on the Mayo panel, winning six Connacht titles in that time and appearing in five All-Ireland finals. Boyle also won four All-Stars in that time, but his Mayo and Davids teammate Michael Conray told Midwest today that he felt he deserved even more. He could have sneaked five and when I think they, they kind of piece Brian Howard in uh, who was playing in the forwards all year just in draft back you know but I think he, he missed out on one, one, one another year when he, when he could have got five All-Stars but look at he, he he started off I suppose in that same tap back then Lee Keegan Donny Vaughan and himself and uh, they were the platform for, for a lot of our attacks and a lot of our, our um, team was built around that sort of um, Line and driving forward, but yeah, look, he, he was he was a, he was a brilliant player. I actually heard 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 about, about him kind of stepping aside a couple of weeks back. But he's that type of fella. He just wanted to go nice and quietly, and uh, you probably won't hear too much about it. You won't hear him hear him hear him screaming too much about it. He, he's that 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 type of guy, you know. Mm. Four All Stars in fourteen years, not too shabby. What a player! And rolling just the five All Ireland finals. This whole generation of Mayo players are retiring with a lot of All Ireland finals under their belts. Mm. And like it was well summed up in that clip, but he he certainly was like a paradigm of what typified that Mayo team through the years and also, also kind of typified how Gaelic football evolved over the course of his career. Got that hard running that just kept going for the full 70 minutes and also adroitness of thought from the half forward line that wasn't necessarily the norm at the early part of the century. So yeah, hell of a player and part of a, a team that will be remembered as one of the all-time great teams even without an All-Ireland win. Richie, I know if there's been a frustration of Munster players over the last decade or so, it's been that there's been far too much churn when it comes to coaching staff and they've yeah. announced departure of a significant figure today. Yeah, interesting one this this evening. Munster announcing that Stephen Larkham is leaving their coaching staff at the end of this season. The ex-Wallaby is returning to his native Australia to pursue a coaching position closer to home. Larkham was appointed as Munster's senior coach in 2019, but he's out of contract at the end of this term. Back in September, the 47-year-old said he wanted to remain with the province, but now says that proves how difficult a decision it's been to reject a contract extension. Johan van Graan, we should note as well, out of contract soon at Munster too. We'll talk about it tomorrow on Wednesday Night Rugby. I mean, it's really disappointing for Munster, Ronan. Larkham was 
in everybody's uh, view, really going to be the driving force behind them playing a more expansive, attractive, uh, threatening brand of rugby. And to what extent he managed to get his fingerprints and get hold of things and, and drive things in that respect is hard to know. I, I feel like I spent a lot of Monday and Wednesday evenings asking various pundits at various times, are we seeing the Stephen Larkham fingerprints on their attacking play yet? And the jury was often out, I have to say. And now he's heading off and there'll be a sense, well, they have to replace him. And, and they're still, based on the early evidence this season, five, six, five rounds of the United and Nations, what's it called again? United, United yeah. Rugby Championship, Jack. Your, your <laughs> Mondays and Wednesdays haven't been that well spent, clearly. Uh, <laughs> I was doing so, I was in such a flow. I was in such a flow. Uh, I've watched all their matches. It was any consolation. I just couldn't remember <laughs> the name of the tournament. The URC. Uh, I think, really, this season, they still haven't clicked from an attacking point of view, and now Larkham's going. So I think that's a blow for Munster, really, and they're going to have to find someone equally well-respected to replace him. So far from ideal. Yeah, because he brought that name, Cachet, goes without saying, and we were probably asking a lot of him to reconstitute an entire way of playing and monster ideology just with one man. I appreciate he was the figurehead, but to your point, to what extent he was able to put his fingerprints on things from an attacking point of view, probably we will learn in, in years to come. But yeah, it's a slight disappointment, the churn in coaching, as you mentioned. Also, the turnover in players probably made things difficult that you look at the the different personnel that make up the Munster team as compared to even a couple of years ago, that uh, it has been a pretty difficult time. And it's not helped by, obviously, Leinster's preeminence at the moment. So it be interesting to see where they turn now. Yeah. United Rugby Championship. It's tricky. As soon as I say United, the nations just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it's too much. It's, it's, it's too, it's too, there's too many syllables in that name. It needs to really get something snappy. Yeah. URC even doesn't even roll off the tongue. You know? no. URC doesn't, it doesn't sound like a sporting acronym for some reason. No, no. URC. It's like, yeah, some kind of waste management company or something. <laughs> and to think how many people that went through before it was okay as well. Yeah. Like they would have gone through like panels and, you know, uh, you know, market research and all this kind of stuff. What do you think? They say, oh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Everybody said, that's fine. Waved it through. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's not great. It's ra- racked up a lot of names, that tournament. Over. Although in fairness, like if, if, if history proves anything, it's that the name won't be around for long and the competition <laughs> will be slightly altered. So we, might, we shouldn't, you know, get too head up about it. Wow. Well. So uh, people will remember there was a Department of Agriculture raid on a premises in Monaster Evan and uh, the test results are in. There were several horses there tested. Yeah, indeed, all horses at that County Galera yard raided earlier this month have tested negative for banned substances. Hair and blood samples were taken from those horses at the Monaster Evan premises. Substances banned for use on race horses were seized in that raid, which was led by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Their investigations still ongoing. They will be providing no further comment, they say, uh, on those investigations until they're concluded. Yeah, so I'm sure a lot of people in the racing world breathing a sigh of relief. Ronan, ultimately for Irish horse racing at the moment, uh, your namesake... The senator wrote a piece. Ronan on, Mullen, Joe. Ronan on, Mullen. Ronan. Let's, let's, yeah. let's be clear. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Continue. Uh, wrote a piece in the Sunday Independent, really saying <laughs> that uh, serious reputational harm has been done to the industry over the last number of months with the various accusations. I suppose primarily we're talking about uh, Jim Bulger's comments initially to the Racing Post, and then there was a follow-up interview with Paul Kimmage, which gained uh, widespread traction as well. And now this uh, raid on the premises in, in Monaster Evan. So reputational damage has been done and this will be a relief, I'm sure, to Manny. But there's, you know, the bulger comments just still hang in the air in a big way. And there's kind of a, a drip drip effect at the moment, like the Sunday papers in particular. I mean, I, I'm kind of a, find myself for the Sunday paper review getting up an hour earlier than usual again, just because <laughs> like I really need to read this carefully and, and be on top of any potential uh, litigious issues it's like the John Delaney uh, era in the Sunday Times where there was stuff uh, non-stop oh God. Uh, so the, but there is there is that feeling at the moment around Irish racing Ronan yeah and as Dan I believe intimated on the Sunday papers last weekend there is a sense with the Ronan Mullen piece in particular that they are the easy target at the moment and that reputational damage that you're alluding to that you know, horse racing's in the eye of the storm and anyone can have a crack off them at the moment. And as as I know from covering the boxing stuff over the last couple of weeks, you know, they're not alone in having issues behind the scenes. So it will be interesting to see what ultimately come of the can of worms that probably Jim Bulger in large part opened a couple of months ago. But uh, it's probably a little while before we get full closure on all that, I'd say. Ronan. The, embarrass- yeah. the embarrassing nature of all that though, Joe, is that 
that raid happened on the same day. I think it was like a couple of hours in the difference. Yeah. That there was that Oireachtas uh, Department of Agriculture subcommittee released a report based on Bulger's accusations that the testing within horse racing and, you know, all of the, uh, everything that goes with it was not actually so par. And they did put forward 11 different recommendations whereby things could still obviously be improved further. But the, no, no sooner was that report out, the news of that raid broke. So there is a gap somewhere between where the testing clearly as it is, is fine. But there, you know, if, if, yeah, quite, you have to ask why a yard has, uh, who's looking after, you know, it's a stud, why they have substances and medicines for horses which are banned for racehorses. Like that's that's ultimately the question that I guess this Department of Agriculture yeah. um, raid is going to try and answer. But now, the, the, the equine therapist there did speak to the racing post at the weekend, the weekend before last, and mm. held his hands up and said, look, they shouldn't have been brought into the country, but they are legal in Kuwait. And that's ultimately where they were going. Held his hands up and said they shouldn't have been brought into the country, but said ultimately they were going to Kuwait, but that's why they were on the premises. So that was that was his explanation. And, uh, well, I guess we'll allow the investigation to yeah. run its course. But uh, I agree. I mean, it was it was a terrible time in the Oireachtas Agriculture Committee rubber stamping the testing on the same day. Interestingly, your namesake, Ronan. I just hear him called Ronan Mullen everywhere he's introduced, by the way. Are you, are you making up the Ronan thing? No, it's, it's, it's definitely Ronan. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, well, I'm going to have to do like what Stephen A. Smith does in um, in America, Joe, and have a middle initial just to differentiate myself. So, yeah. What is what is your middle name? Uh, well, Jared would be the first one up there. So it would be Ronan, Ronan G. G. What, up, Mullen. what up, G? Ronan G. Yeah, it could work. Okay. Could work. Ronan G. Goal is... Goal from Manchester United, by the way. Yes. Goal from Manchester United. And it looks to be Ronaldo, and it's a brilliant finish. It is indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. a brilliant finish. Goalkeeper. Cock up in defence, to be fair. Of things. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, we're jumping all over each other. Fred, sure. with, a, with a brilliant tackle, in fairness, as goalkeeper passes to midfielder. Fred nips it, breaks to Ronaldo, and it's a wonderful first time finish where he has his back to goal, but he knows the keeper is off his line, and so steals a glance, turns, and just uh, side foots it, half volley over the goalkeeper. Easy finish. Makes those look easy. United 1 0 up. Can I get to this pass. Ronan Mullen point, please? Yes. Jeez, I've been blathering on. I'm boring myself at this stage. Uh, he did make the point about the Oireachtas committee that, you know, it's all very well getting a few people in from racing and interviewing them for, you know, four or five hours and taking their word for everything and then rubber stamping testing and saying everything's A-OK. -okay. That doesn't really cut the mustard. And I thought that was a fair point. That was all I wanted to say. It wasn't worth the wait, really. I've been trying to bring in that That's point fair. for five Ronan, minutes. R Ronan G, Ronan G over here approves, approves <laughs> the comment, <laughs> I, th I think to be fair and uh, Horse Racing Ireland mentioned this uh, when the Bulger comments first came out as well that their testing processes are in line with best practice I think not only in the UK but across I think they're actually they go further than the, than the uh, testing processes in the UK if I remember correctly yeah. what Brian Kavanagh said at the time and they are actually in line with what's going on across Europe so if, the, if it is an Irish problem then it's a European problem as well with testing Well that's true and there's quite a few substances which are not allowed in Ireland and are allowed across the water so um, these points are all valid as well uh, if we were ever Ronan to have a, an interview where Ronan Mullen interviews Ronan Mullen oh Jesus it's the one what, everyone wants what do we call that slot 53106 everybody I don't know I just want to get to such a such renown Joe that I can drop the second name and just call myself like like Beyonce or Adele I can sure. just take ownership of, of Ronan and Ronan Keating and all the others Ronan oh, Keating. He's, even he's done terrible damage to your name in fairness isn't he Ronan, Ronan Keating Ronan is Ronan Keating the most famous Ronan in Ireland? Well, I'd have Ronan Collins up there. Ronan okay. Collins, yeah. Collins Ronan Keller could be there, Joe. He's already a British and Irish line. If he can put Kelleher, a Keith Wood esque career, he'd be he'd be up there. Kelleher, Collins, Mullen, and Mullen again. Mullen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think it's time for us to go. Clearly, Ronan G and Richie yeah. McCormick. Thank you. Eyes up. Cheers, lads. Your chance to win big. News Talk's Cash Machine. Now, we had another winner in the News Talk Cash Machine this afternoon. We're very happy to say we're in a nice little run at the moment. It was Helen Ward from Rohini in County Dublin. Helen knew the correct amount was €7,523.38 when Barry Dunn called her just after 3 o'clock today. So well done, Helen. Congrats. There'll be another chance to win tomorrow when we open the cash machine for business once again. News Talk Breakfast. Just after 8 a.m. is when you'll find out just how much you could win. The News Round on Off The Ball with Gillette. Proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, 
Start your razors. Nevin McGuire here, and I love this time of year. It's a great time to try out new recipes for the big day. It'll come as no surprise that I think cookware makes a great Christmas gift. And my cook with Nevin McGuire range at Dunn Stores has plenty to choose from. You'll find lots of great gift ideas from colorful cast iron pots to the versatile skillet pan, as well as great kitchen gadgets. Shop the Cook with Nevin McGuire range at Dunn Stores today in